let me start with a case study that will illustrate a little bit about what we're doing in this class, where we're going in this class, and it'll help me to get to know you a little bit as well. This happened when uh, I had just been installed Dean of the Business School at Regent University. And one of the first things that happened after that promotion was that one of our alums of the, uh, the MBA program made it onto the show The Apprentice. You familiar with that show? The, the Donald Trump show? Million people applied to be on this show. 18 made it on. One of our students, our alums, we'll call her Marsha for the sake of discussion here. You'll see why I can't use her real name shortly. But Marsha made it on to the show, and we were just absolutely uh, delighted by that. And so the media came to me and said, what do you think about Marsha's chances on the show. And if, if you're not familiar with the show, 18 people come on, they, they, they split them into two teams, they battle it out on a number of different business tasks. Whichever team makes less money gets called into the boardroom. One of them, usually the leader of that task, gets fired. And they keep doing that all the way down to the point where there's just one person left, one apprentice. It's really the best of what corporate America can offer. You know, bring in 18, fire 17 of them, it's social evolution or something like that. Whatever the case may be, that's the way the show works. What do you think of Marsh's chances? And I, I probably sounded a whole lot like a college coach. Yeah, well, she's been trained up well. She's strong. She's determined. I think she could go all the way. And so they, they write some story with a headline like, you know, Dean likes alums' chances with the Donald. What else is he going to say? So part of my job that semester was to watch reality TV. And I dutifully did so every Tuesday night on NBC. I watched The Apprentice. And for the first several weeks of the show, Marsha kind of laid low. She didn't take a leadership position. She was a good contributor, you know, part of the team. Sometimes her team won, sometimes her team lost, sometimes they were called into the boardroom, sometimes they weren't. But Marsha survived several weeks by just getting the lay of the land and seeing how things worked. I thought it was a pretty wise strategy. Finally, around week eight or nine of the show, she did step up into a leadership position for her team. There are only about four or five on each team by this point. And how do you think Marsha did? This student of mine, this alum of our illustrious business school. Well, I've kind of signaled what's going to happen here. <laughs> uh, and she, she crashed and burned. I mean, it, it was ugly. She was officious. She was bossy. She was harsh. She was controlling. Nobody wanted to follow her anywhere, except maybe out of morbid curiosity or something. But <laughs> As a result, her team lost miserably in that task. They were called into the boardroom, and Marsha was summarily and ignominiously fired by the Donald. She got into her taxi, and she went home. And the, uh, the media came back to me at that point and said, well, what do you think of Marsha now? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, you never know how NBC edits these things. I heard it wasn't really as bad as, uh, as it seemed and, and all that kind of thing. But NBC didn't put the words in her mouth. NBC didn't do the nonverbals. NBC didn't script any of this. Marsha did an abysmal job as a leader in that role, in that very public role that you know, millions of people watching our alums. But I thought it was over at that point. I thought, okay, this is behind me. I don't have to watch this dumb thing on Tuesday nights anymore. And they say bad publicity is better than no publicity, so that's, that may not have been a terrible thing. Well, it got worse. Because two days later, I'm, I'm sitting in my office with uh, a couple of Bolivian businessmen, guys who I thought would donate to the school. I thought these guys were good for about a million dollars to the business. Well, this is what deans do, by the way. Some of what deans do, if you're ever wondering. We talk with people about giving lots of money to the school. And so I'm talking to these guys. And I'm getting to the point where what development people call the, the ask, where we've laid all the foundation. I've been telling them about what I was calling the, the finest Christian business program on the planet. I now know that's in error. You know, now I know that it's, it's Messiah College, not, not Regent <laughs> University. But despite that, this is the sales pitch that I was giving to them. And I was just getting to the point where I was going to ask them to stroke a check for our business school. When to my door, and I don't know why I left my door open, but to my door came one of my other MBA students. His name was Evan. And he's white as a ghost. And he's standing at the door. Now, you got to get the picture here, because th these guys had their back to the door. They're just looking at me. I'm looking at them and the door about 10 feet behind them. So they have no idea what's going on behind them. And Evan is standing there looking panicked. And I'm trying to ignore him as we're having our conversation. I don't know what he's doing there. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of a meeting. But he starts waving like this. 
Evan, what are you doing? I mean, we've got to be teaching emotional intelligence here in addition to some of the other stuff that we teach. He starts waving, and I'm ignoring him. Then he holds up a magazine. These guys have no idea what's going on behind them, and he holds up this magazine. Doug, would you, would you do this for me? Just hold up something that looks like a magazine and start waving it back and forth. Not, not that fast, a little, little slower. Yeah, just, just like that. Yeah, yeah, it's almost exactly like that. Were you there? I mean, you... <laughs> The magazine didn't say becoming a critical thinker, unlike this book. I could see even from this distance that it was a, uh, a gentleman's magazine, if you know what I mean. And not GQ or Sports Illustrated. It was one of those magazines with this very scantily clad woman on the... What is this guy doing? So I, I'm just about to get up and go close the door, with Evan on the other side of the door, that is, when to my horror, Evan comes into the room magazine in hand and puts it down on the table in front of me and my guests. And who do you think is on the cover of the magazine? Wouldn't be a very interesting story, would it? If it weren't Marsha on the cover of this ma the girls of the apprentice issue of this magazine. And there she is on the cover. And to remove all doubt about what's going on, Evan said, and I kid you not, that that, that's Marsha. That, that, that's our student. Now, now I'm the one who's white. My Bolivian friends there looked at me, folded their arms as if to say, you are not the best Christian business program on the planet. Uh, you may be, in fact, the worst Christian business program on the planet. We now know two of your students. The guy who carries around these magazines and the girl who poses in them. <laughs> And they were out of there and on the next plane to Bolivia or to some other school. We lost the, uh, the money because of this. Horrified. Now, the media comes back to me. <laughs> well, what do you think of Marcia now? Uh, at which point I said no comment and referred them to our very fine, capable public relations department. And they handled it from there. The case question I'd like you guys to think about is this. Marcia was a talented woman. She was smart enough to get onto the show. She had been through a Christian undergraduate program. She had been through a Christian MBA program. But still, she was a very poor leader on the show. And she, more importantly, she was a very poor leader of young professional women everywhere who saw her as a role model. Lots of people watching this show every week. How is it that somebody like Marcia could get to the point where she had those kinds of values and that kind of, of leadership. What do you think may have influenced Marsha? Here's some elaboration, I guess, on what you guys are already saying. A number of the things up there you have, in fact, identified as possible influencers on Marsha and on all the marshes of the world and, and on us, right? Whether various kind of role models or friends or workplace norms. And I mean, we've been talking about very negative ones or potentially negative ones. There are very positive ones as well. It's family or, or church or the various kinds of schooling. But media, music lyrics, you name it, there is an entire culture out there that can influence the way we think. And don't miss this, folks. As we think, so we do. Ever think about that? A lot of our morality begins at the cognitive level. A lot of the things we do on a daily basis, including our leadership, begins at the cognitive level. As we think, so we do. And many of these influences affected or potentially affected her thinking. And we could possibly categorize most of these that we've discussed are in fact environmental or cultural. Whether it is something that comes from the corporate culture, you were saying the people around her on the show, could be in the, the corporate culture, the norms there affect who we are in that particular context, or the, the, the societal culture, you know, the, the celebrities, the athletes, the advertisements that we're exposed to, the music, the books, the articles, the internet, you name it. The, the societal culture can affect us, or our culture in, in our family. You see up here the upbringing at, at home, you guys are, are all over these ideas. But every one of these things in red is essentially a, a cultural influencer to affect her, her worldview, her thinking, ultimately her decisions as a leader, a leader on the show and as a leader of young professional women looking to her as a role model. As we think, so we do, and the culture can affect our thinking. But we can go beyond that. Let me just bring some of the science into this. 
this is typical of what's out there in the academic literature regarding the culture behavior linkage. Here's from a handbook on cross-cultural psychology. It says this, the overwhelming majority of cultural researchers assume explicitly that culture, however you define that, is an antecedent to human behavior. That culture affects behavior. May seem obvious to us, but uh, at some level, it appears that nearly all social scientists in this field acknowledge that culture can play a crucial role in shaping virtually any kind of human behavior. Does that resonate with you? I mean, does that, that kind of make sense? What is shocking about a comment like this is this, this middle line here that says it appears that nearly all social scientists in this field acknowledge that. Do you know how hard it is to get almost all social scientists to agree on anything? this is miraculous. I mean, there really must be some sort of truth here if the research is that consistent. The science clearly points to a linkage between culture and our behavior. We can go further than that, though, looking at some of the theology. This is Pauline theology from the book of Colossians. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive, talking to the Colossians here, no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and on the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. He's talking to a group of people who are embracing Jesus as one of many gods, sort of the way we might in our pluralistic uh, syncretistic society that we have here. He's, it, could, it could have been written yesterday. See to it that no one takes you captive through these deceptive philosophies, through these ideas about how we need to live, about how we need to lead, about how we ought to be out there in the world. This is very interesting when we see science and scripture comport this way, when they point in the same direction so clearly. The point that we're trying to make here is just that. Science and scripture and really our, our personal experience. You said, yeah, this resonates with me. This, this is something I've seen before. Culture can significantly affect our worldview and as such affects our behavior. Or it can if we let it. Not just negatively, but positive to, positively as well. well. We'll get to that in due time. Beyond these cultural influencers, Patrick was saying, well, what about her pride? What about her ego? What about who she is independent of how she has been influenced by the environment? Might that not have had some kind of, of influence on her? For sure, that is a possibility. In fact, you've been around, around churches and around theology long enough to recognize this perhaps as something that theologians call the flesh. Right? And when the Bible talks about the flesh, at least when the New Testament talks about the flesh, they're not talking about skin, right? They're not talking about meat here. We're talking, this is uh, metaphorical or, or symbolic at least, we're talking about who we are, as it says on this, this slide here, who we are without God, who we are in our own natural abilities. And you can think about the flesh as our, our desires or the things that we want. We're all born with it. We want food. We want love. We want security. We might want a family. We might want to be entertained. We might want a good name. We might want a good reputation. We might want control. We might want autonomy. We might want a whole lot of things. Is that bad? And from a theological perspective, no. It's, I mean, God gave us these desires. They're good. He gave us hunger because he wants us to eat. He gave us the desire for love because he wants us to go out and get married and have families and, and uh, advance civilization that way. He gave us these desires, and they are good things. However, how does it connect to Patrick's comment about her pride, her ego? The problem comes when these desires that we have start to govern us. That's when it can become a problem, when it becomes the arbiter of right and wrong, when it becomes the thing that is essentially the filter through which we see the world and make decisions. You see the difference? I mean, if, if you just think of a, of a young child, they're totally governed by their desires, right? I just want this. I want this food. I want this candy. I want this toy. And you can talk to them all you want about, if you have this, then it's really going to be a bad choice. It's going to break or, you know, it's not going to be good for you. It doesn't matter. I want it. And they scream and yell and they want it and, and maybe eventually they get it. But that is a mind that is governed by the flesh, governed by who we are, independent of God. As we mature, we should get beyond that. And we do get beyond that where we make choices that we, we see that that's not the only thing we want and maybe we should, we should choose a little more discerningly. But if we don't, if we're governed by that, that is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 8. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. You know, what does this mean for Marcia? 
well, maybe there was this war going on inside of her. And just knowing her, the way I knew her, probably true. This war that the Apostle Paul talks about in Galatians and in Romans, the war between the flesh and the spirit, is probably raging inside of her. Ultimately, maybe the flesh won out here. And I'm not going to read through all this. You've seen this before. But the, the works of the flesh are this, this awful list of things that you know, we don't even want to read because it's so, so depressing. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, etc. Right? That juxtaposition of these two things. Or even Paul waiting in his ministry saying, the things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I do anyway. What a miserable person I am. He's talking about the flesh here. He's talking about who he is without God. We want to get to the point where we cannot do the things that we want to do. And we want to get to the point where we can do the things that we don't want to do. Beyond these environmental influences, there are some innate influences. And we really should not discount that possibility. It had nothing to do with, or less to do with her environment, and everything to do with who we are on our own, autonomous without God. Okay. And the environmental influences, the innate or immutable influences. And then there's possibly one other, which might leave some of us shaking our head, but what about supernatural influences on who we are and what we do? It's easy to think about when we, we say, well, you know, God is imminent, God is near to us, God is guiding us, God helps me. I mean, that's a supernatural influence on the choices we make in daily life and in our leadership. But what about the other side of the coin? Is there another supernatural influence that may, in fact, seek to undermine us? Well, according to scripture, there is. All right, Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, uh, there's uh, a number of scriptures that point to this force out there as a tempter, an accuser, an agent of evil. Is that possible? I mean, what, do you, what do you think of that theory? What do you think of that theology that uh, the devil made her do it? <laughs> That sound too preposterous? How many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis? He wrote this book, The Screwtape Letters. Screwtape Letters is a, a fascinating look at what hell might be like. And Screwtape, it's a person here, is like a senior devil or a senior tempter who throughout this book is trying to counsel or mentor a junior tempter named Wormwood. And he's saying, this is how you can get this person to turn his back on God ultimately and join us in hell forever. That's the whole point of the book. Lewis is trying to give us an inside look as to what, what hell might be like and how Satan might tempt us. And he says in here, this is just uh, one, one little piece. He's talking about uh, things from, from Satan's perspective. He says, I wonder why you ask me whether it's essential that you keep the patient in ignorance of your existence. The patient being the individual they're trying to tempt. Why are you asking me whether, uh, whether you should keep him in ignorance of your, of your existence? The question, at least for the present phase of the struggle, has been answered for us by the high command. Our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves. What's he saying? Our policy for the moment, dear Wormwood, my nephew, my apprentice here, is to conceal ourselves. Don't let them believe that you even exist. He's saying, I do not think you'll have much difficulty keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him the picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he can't believe in that, he therefore cannot believe in you. What's Lewis saying about Satan here? Satan wants us to disbelieve in his existence. Why? Because if we disbelieve in his existence, then we are more vulnerable. The same way if we disbelieve that culture will affect our behavior, we might be more vulnerable to the influence of culture. The point is that there are some pretty smart people out there who have said that there are influences on us that may be invisible and we may not have any idea that they are there. And we may live in a culture, we may live in a world that tells us they don't exist. And we might believe it. And when we, when we believe it, well, we may, in fact, be more vulnerable. One of the possibilities here is that Marcia has been influenced by a number of different things. And historically, what theologians and others have said is, you could take these three things and say, that's where all sin comes from, or that's where all temptation comes from, these three forces. 
the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world being this cultural we've been discussing, the flesh being the comments we just made about who we are without God, the devil being Satan himself actually present, tempting us personally. Throughout history, theologians and some very wise ones have talked about this. Thomas Aquinas, we know that every temptation is either from the world, the flesh, or the devil. Hundreds of years ago, one of the best theologians in history says this is where it comes from. St. John of the Cross, a mystic from the 16th century. All the evils to which the soul is subject proceed from the three enemies already mentioned, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Or even in the Anglican Church, the Episcopalian Church, from their Book of Common Prayer, a part of their liturgy. From the deceits of the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, good Lord, deliver us. The basic question we asked at the very beginning of this is, how could this happen to Marcia? How could this potentially happen to people like us, who should know better? who've been trained to be better than this. Well, maybe it's because these various forces, these various kinds of temptations have affected her. It's a course about leadership. It's a course about the inner life of a leader. But to properly talk about such things, we need to discuss what might the obstacles be? What might the impediments be? And as you see here, these various forces of the world flesh, the devil, may manifest themselves as a number of different daily obstacles. What does faithful leadership look like on a daily basis? It looks like humility rather than pride. What does it look like? It looks like passion rather than passivity and indifference. What does it look like? It looks like excellence rather than mediocrity. And what does faithful leadership look like? It looks like integrity rather than duplicity. It looks like reconciliation and patience with people rather than revenge retaliation. And what does it look like? It looks like courage rather than fear. This is essentially a roadmap of the course. We're going to be going through a number of different virtues. The point of the course is not necessarily to teach leadership practices, how to go out and be a better leader tomorrow. The point of the course is to lay the foundation, the groundwork that is absolutely necessary if you're going to go out and be an authentic, consistent Christian leader.